So thank you for, for joining us, both for the bigger conference and for this session on what, what managing partners have learned during, during COVID. Um, we've got three managing partners as, as official speakers, and we've got others that are on the call now or are joining. Um, we're going to run this session more as a discussion and less as a, as a formal panel. So there, um, and, unless we get quite, quite crowded, there's no need to keep your microphone muted or, or, you know, stay, stay still in your seat. Um, we'd love to have a discussion with both the ideas that our panelists bring and that Sylvia, our moderator brings, and then your own experiences. We, we started to touch on some of that just at the end of the first session on this today. And it was, it made me wish we had another half hour because mm -hmm. the comments were really interesting. So I just want to take a moment to introduce Sylvia. Sylvia has um, a long history with Ally Law. She was involved in the project in 2000, I think it began in 2007, that suggested that the organization um, grow and adapt and change to remain vibrant in ways that that the organization subsequently did. So she knows us very well. Um, we Early in both of our careers, we were in-house in law firm marketing positions in Minneapolis, which is a kind of a strange bond. And then Sylvia was at Hildebrandt and then at Law Vision after uh, Thompson spun the Hildebrandt brand out. So she was a founding partner at Law Vision. Um, she is a writer and her, her latest piece on Amazon is on exactly this topic. Um, what managing partners have learned during COVID-19. Actually, I saw the title on Amazon and that made me think we should do this session. <laughs> so that's a bit of an introduction and um, Sylvia, you can take it from here. Thank you, thank you, Wendy. Well, you know, since we have an intimate group, maybe instead of me introducing the, the original three panelists, um, I would love everybody to just introduce themselves, go around and um, let, let us know your law firm and, and, uh, and maybe, you know, our first thing is what, what is the greatest challenge that you continue to face as managing partner during these incredibly challenging times? And keep in mind, we're dealing with two things here, right? We're dealing with COVID, which overshadows everything and it's so hard to forget about it day to day. And we're still we're we're also dealing with significant changes in the legal industry, right? You know, with the with um, the erosion of various pieces of the of the legal pro product, e-discovery, and other things uh, by lesser priced uh, businesses. Where we've got the alternative legal service providers, we've got um, firms spinning out and doing really interesting. Uh, pricing models like Rod's firm, I believe, Summit Law Group, right? You guys are doing some really cool stuff. Um, and, and, and let us not forget the big four. And then the global, the, the global varines, the, the global firms. So there's really a lot going on in parallel. So we can't take our foot off the gas on that while we're dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges that continue to emerge with COVID. So with that, um, would love to hear from from each of you, you know, name, firm, how long have you been managing partner and what's the biggest challenge in both those camps there that you're facing today? Rod, you're in the top left of my screen, so I'll call on you first. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Rod Yonker. I'm the, the reluctant CEO of uh, Summit Law Group in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> I think I've had that role now something like eight of the last 10 years, I managed to, to pass it off to somebody for about 18 months, but it came back like a boomerang. Um, I actually think in, in answer to your question, Sylvia, about the challenges that I see right now, I'm not sure I could pick one. Um, I, I would say that the two that are kind of most on my radar, uh, the first is that, that our firm you know, despite our our efforts to over the last several years to continue to kind of strengthen business relationships across our practice groups, the the real tie that binds our firm is still more cultural, 
Um, it's the way we practice and it's the type of people we are, not so much the fact that we're interdependent on the same clients across groups. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's a test to, to keep going in good times. I mean, that's something that needs a lot of care and feeding, the, the culture and the personal relationships in the firm. And, and that's obviously a lot more difficult uh, when you can't see each other on a regular basis. So I, I think that's that's been... Um, a challenge for us. It remains a challenge for us, particularly as as you know weeks turn to months that that are turning to you know a year or more. Mm. The other thing that that I think is a challenge from my chair is that uh, I, I don't know about anywhere else, but in the attorney in the law firms that I've been in, attorneys tend to be um, incredibly risk averse and. You know, one of the dynamics that, that started happening in our firm immediately when, when COVID hit was uh, people became very concerned about taking risk and, and very conservative in their thinking. And that's coincided with a, a time in the life of our firm when we're hitting on all cylinders, you know, all the practice groups are kind of overcommitted in terms of, of their capacity. And it's a buyer's market for talent. And so, you know, convincing my partners that we need to be buying on the way down has been a challenge um, and that's something that that also is taking a lot of energy and, and hand holding so. interesting that came up this morning too that um, in in some cases firms are saying this is a great market to be looking at who we want to recruit because they could work from anywhere there's no you know, there's no reason they have to move to X city um, and practice. They can practice remotely if that's their choice and they want to join the firm. So there is a bit of that going on as well. Well, I think from from our perspective, we're awfully particular about who we add and, and um, you know, the, the people that, that we're most interested in are often coveted by the places that they're at currently. And those ties are loosened in, in this economy right now with a lot of firms that are struggling and, and um, you know, seeing some real threats to their business. So I think mm -hmm. we're finding that there are opportunities to add that one or two, you know, really key people that we'd like to, to round out some practices. And it's just, you know, as I say, it just takes a little bit of, of hand holding to to keep all of the members on board with that. Definitely, definitely. Ramesh, how about you? Hi everyone, um, uh, this is Ramesh Vaidyanathan. I'm, I've been the managing partner for the, all of the 10 years that our firm has been around. So that's been, that's been fun. A lot of interesting stuff uh, over the years, but this is, uh, this is very unique. Um, you know, we've, um, as a country, you know, we had a uh, nationwide lockdown, um, which was imposed in March uh, for three weeks. Um, and then it continued for several months after that. And mind you, this is the biggest lockdown in the world uh, when the prime minister uh, you know, ordered 1.3 billion people to stay at home. So that was, um, you know, uh, quite something. Um, in terms of, uh, from the perspective of clients, I would say, uh, you know, we realized uh, early on uh, in the game that, um, you know, clients were squeezing margins. Uh, uh, I think they were expecting faster turnaround um, and perhaps even greater use of technology. Um, uh, and, and I think we, we, we'd like to believe we realized it uh, before it was too late. Um, but if we don't really change uh, culturally, uh, our clients are going to go somewhere else. So I think uh, I think the, the first step was to really see the new reality. And I think that's where, uh, and we kind of identified three, four key issues. Uh, one is uh, cash flow. How are we going to manage um, uh, cash flow, um, you know, without, uh, you know, without things really going out of, out of hand. Uh, the second was uh, employee well-being um, in terms of, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I'd like to believe that, you um, uh, law firms will be remembered for um, how they treated uh, staff during the pandemic and the immediate uh, aftermath of the uh, pandemic. Um, we've also uh, kind of learned new ways of communicating with staff to, uh, you know, kind of maintain engagement, motivation, um, you know, and, and things like that. Uh, essentially, mental well-being, uh, you know, which has been mm -hmm. a factor, you know, 
and and that's one on one on one conversations you know we we do have regular team calls uh, you know we uh, it's more a uh, lot of time is spent on um, informal chats uh, you know we a lot of appreciation emails and things like that so that you know, the, the morale is kept uh, you know kept high uh, the other aspect that we uh, focused on is client service to what extent will the quality and the turnaround time get impacted uh, because we're not uh, together uh, in in one building or you know we uh, and we had other things to take care of um, and particularly in the indian context what happens is that um, you know you, you have people to help you at home you know there's a, there's a driver to take you to the office so and because all of these support systems were taken away um, you know you you had to really spend a lot of time um, you know managing those as well so to what extent will your client deliveries get impacted uh, as of some of these new challenges that you're faced with in life um then the other issue was uh, data and uh, you know regulatory breaches uh, you know reputational risks as a consequence of that uh, you know so um, so uh, yeah i think some of these issues were the key things that we had to confront um, you know um, uh, as we um, you know as we moved into this uh, pandemic Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Colin, how how about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a complete opposite to what happened for India. I mean, Hong Kong has been really so lucky and so fortunate in that since the very beginning, when it all started, I remember being with um, with um, Andrew and Michael Gorton in Australia when a Grand Formula One got cancelled, and I had to get my way back to Hong Kong via Sydney. And everything, the whole world was exploding. Hong Kong kept its borders open for a bit, then closed all the borders. There has been no lockdown here at all. Yes, the courts did close for a little bit at the very beginning, or you couldn't file stuff. In the and so, it, in, and if you think about the figures, and I and I send out this daily, weekly sort of newsletter to everyone, giving everyone the updates in Hong Kong, and you know. Since the very beginning of March to now, we've had 5,400 cases. Right. We have had 107 deaths. Of that 107, I think 80% were over the age of 70-ish, approximately. There's a couple of, of people, in the, a couple of young people as well, had, and all had basically serious preconditions. So, for us, you know, and I've been a sort of looking after this the firm has you know, our firm been in existence for. 38, 35 years. Um, I've been managing partner for 33 years. Um, so uh, there were challenges, not the challenges for physically here in Hong Kong, but what do we do? Sort of safeguard. Everyone worry. Should we come to the office? Should we have our firm open? What are we doing? How are we looking after all our staff? And what I learned was at the time was to keep a very calm and think it all through. And after a sort of quick morning discussion, what two couple of hours with my other partners, um, we all decided that the only approach was to keep the office open, but with different ideas, let people, you know, flexibility, you can work a bit at home, come in, but keep the same as going. So the minute we opened our office, and then until right on to now, business has been expanding and because I'm here in Hong Kong and I'm not traveling so much and I've not been so you know out of the office I've been busy sort of getting new business here in Hong Kong and keeping the firm busy and we really haven't apart we haven't seen there's been there's been business as usual except lifestyles have changed I think the biggest impact upon us is the worry we have for let's say like myself with family back in the UK friends in Europe friends all over the world hearing you know, stories aren't, which are not nice. And Hong Kong being what we call, I wanted to call it the hermit kingdom, in that nobody goes <laughs> in, nobody goes out. But, you know, and we're cocooned within the, you know, within the motherland of China over the border. So, of course, we've had national security issues. We've had uh, the troubles, you know, with all the demonstrations. So we have lots of political turmoil, um, which China has used under the cover of COVID, and certainly to extend their influence here in Hong Kong. So mm-hmm. issues we're dealing with now are more so geopolitic and sort of, you know, we're watching what's happening over the big ponds with America. 
I mean, will Biden be any better than Trump and how they deal with China? What's going to affect our business with our staff, people not being able to, to, you know, to travel? So it's sort of what I have learned is sensitivity. You know, some people were worried even getting on the train. The longest commute to Hong Kong is 45 minutes and people were worried about that. And I said, well, go in a bit earlier, go in a bit later. Or I said, we'll pay for you to have a taxi. The taxis are very cheap here. You know, we'll you know, call yourself with a couple of other workers. So we were trying to change, but really it has been, you know, business as usual, except the Hong Kong government gave us quite a lot of money. You know, they gave us, you know, they gave every single firm, um, they gave us 80% of the wages of all employees for two or four, six months. So that's very nice. Mm -hmm. you know, and it was it, it would happen. So really, uh, you know, I'm using Zoom more. Don't like it, hate it. I don't like technology particularly. You know, it's not my cup of tea. I, you know, I just don't like it. You know, I like to see so I like to look somebody in the eyes. You know, I'm going to court. I got a six month trial starting next month. I got a London QC arriving here. But you know, my life is sort of on a hold. I can't do the things I really want to do. You know, coming up. You know. I'm at the age now when I'm coming to the end of my legal world. Everyone says that. I don't think I am, but people say that. What is my retirement strategy at the age of 65? Why aren't I just sort of hanging up my boots? And I said, no, and I quite like what I'm doing. So those are the changes we're feeling here in Hong Kong. It's more self-aware. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. a better person for it all, frankly. Mm -hmm. David, how about you? So um, we're looking at, you know, keeping our foot on the gas, just as a reminder, during COVID um, in terms of staying competitive, um, uh, looking at the potential threats to the practice. And on the other hand, um, we still have to deal with COVID every day. So biggest challenges you face, what you're doing to, to stay, to keep your firm focused on the future at the same time. I guess I guess there's a couple of Davids, which which David. Oh, sorry, David Gross. Okay, yeah. So for for us, um, you know, I think the biggest challenge uh, we've had is not so much the the client um, the clients coming or going. I, I think that in a lot of respects, our caseloads and our clients have increased because of the need that we represent a lot of municipal communities. We represent school districts, mm -hmm. and they've had enormous challenges during this this uh, pandemic and uh, it's increased our workload um, a lot. And I think the litigation has slowed a little bit, but, but we've made up it for other grounds. I think the biggest challenge for us is I think the collegiality that we, we, we crave because we're a smaller office. We have about 20 lawyers here in Anchorage and there's something about being able to walk down the hallway and, and have a conversation with your partner or, or an associate or uh, to have those direct interactions. And that is just not there. And I don't think I've done a great job of trying to facilitate those communications that we, you know, we tried to do some zoom meetings. We've also tried to do some sort of social activities on zoom and it hasn't worked um, particularly well. And we're trying, we're continuing to trying to do different things, but it's just hard um, to have that kind of connection. I, and we were, we're right in the process of doing our year in performance reviews. And it is particularly highlighted by, by having to do those because we like, for example, we had three lawyers start with us March one, which was like the worst possible timing <laughs> for the start. And, um, you know, since March one, I've had very little direct interaction with them just because they're not in the office uh, very often. And, um, you know, so that's something that I'm, that I'm still struggling with. I'm still working on uh, to try to get uh, a mechanism in place where we could have those direct communications, those interactions, those social connections that um, you just you just typically do one on one, but can't anymore. I think that's been the biggest challenge for for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. You Shen, we saw you briefly. <laughs> How about you? Just introduction, firm um, challenges as the managing partner. Up, oh, you're muted. There you go. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Is that mm -hmm. good? 
Yes, welcome. Yeah, hi everyone. So this is, yeah, hi. A uh, little bit impromptu at the moment, um, but anyway, sorry about that. My internet connection seems to be a little bit slow, but uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Yushan from RLSCKO. I uh, see a couple of familiar faces, so good to see everyone's good. Um, well, the COVID-19 situation in Malaysia uh, seems to be a bit erratic. Uh, the cases seem to fluctuate. Sometimes it's under control. We had it under control uh, earlier this year. So in, on, on the 18th of March this year, the government imposed uh, a, a full lockdown uh, and it's called the movement control order. And essentially what that meant was most of the industry, in fact, all of the industries, except the essential ones uh, were forced to, to close down. And uh, that started with a two week, um, a two week lockdown and the government then extended it by another two weeks and it ended up going for, I think about, if I'm not mistaken, about two months, right? So during that time, um, you know, this being the first time we've ever experienced a full lockdown, uh, we had to, to work from home. And uh, as a law firm, obviously that posed quite a bit of challenges. Um, because most of the files, the property type of the property files were located in the office. Uh, and that being the case, uh, a lot of my staff, uh, the clerks and, and the lawyers handling the property work, didn't have physical access to the files. And that obviously posed a challenge. And so we had to find workarounds or, or, or alternatives uh, to that. Um, so that's that's one. In terms of, I suppose, corporate work, that was a little bit easier, the corporate commercial type of work. We could still communicate by email with our clients, hop onto Zoom meetings, everything was pretty much online. I guess the whole, you know, that whole sudden lockdown um, did pose certain challenges, of, uh, 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 well, did highlight, I guess, the, the lack of... Um, systems, you know, online systems that we had in place. And with that, we, we're moving towards a more automated system to make sure that, you know, uh, our files, most of our files are now available online. Uh, we're considering moving to a cloud where we store all our files on cloud, which means that if there's another full lockdown, we will be able to then work from home and access those files on the cloud. Um, so after that MCO, the government eased the restrictions and we went into the second phase, which was called the conditional movement control order. And during the conditional movement control order, there, uh, certain restrictions were eased and certain essential sectors of the economy were allowed to open. So banks were allowed to open, certain government offices were allowed to open. And law firms specifically that were supporting these essential sectors were also allowed to operate. Uh, so that eased the restriction until we went back to the office uh, in phases. So during that time, um, we implemented obviously strict SOPs at the office, temperature checks, uh, mask wearing, um, you, know, um, you know, reminders to wash and sanitize your hands properly. We were still limiting the number of physical meetings we had. So most of the meetings were done virtually. Uh, and then after that CMCO period, uh, the restrictions were eased further, and we went into what we call the uh, RMCO, which was the Recovery Movement Control Order, uh, which eased restrictions even further. So more sectors, actually almost all economic sectors were allowed to open. So in a nutshell, um, that was the movement control mm -hmm. order that we had. And during the R RCMO, I guess the cases started to spike again. It started to surge. And um, we're now back into the CMCO phase. <laughs> so unfortunately, yeah, we're now back in the CMCO case, uh, phase. And I guess the reason for that was um, there was a, a, a state election recently in Sabah. And I guess uh, um, the, the, because of the election and because of the number of politicians from the West uh, in Peninsular Malaysia, going to campaign in Sabah and East Malaysia, 
that caused an increase of spike of cases. And some of these politicians or some of their team members actually brought COVID back to the peninsula, you see. Mm. So that also, you know, uh, contributed to the rise of the spike in cases recently. So we've been having sporadic cases of clusters of COVID cases, uh, you know, all around uh, Kuala Lumpur, which is the capital city. And um, so then, you know, the government felt that, you know, it doesn't have a choice. So it, we, so it imposed the CMCO phase again. Um, so the cases have been rising. Uh, and right now, uh, for certain sectors of the industry, only 10% of the management of the management uh, 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 of, of the company uh, is allowed to go into the office on certain days. The other, other members of the, uh, the other personnel in the office are allowed to go in as normal, as usual. But in order to limit the number of people working at the office and to encourage more people to work from home, they've imposed 10%. So that's so about it. Big uh, challenges. In a nutshell, the situation yeah. Thank yeah. you, big challenges. Andrew, what about your firm? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. For those that don't know me, Andrew Parler, I'm a principal at Russell Kennedy in Melbourne. I'm not a managing partner. Um, and from what I've heard, I don't want to be and have no intention of <laughs> being a managing partner. Um, I think health and wellbeing is probably the biggest issue we're faced. Um, Melbourne's been under a working from home directive since March. Um, we've been very adaptable in how we've manage that, profitability is being retained. Um, and there's lots of Zoom catch-ups and whatnot, but it's just not the same as meeting mm -hmm. someone in person. You don't really get an insight in, into whether they're struggling, how they're getting on um, over Zoom. Um, and actually, it was just this morning I was talking to, to Michael Gordon, who's another partner in Melbourne, and he's started to pick up on it, and I'm feeling um, that it's just it's all getting on top of everyone, and we need a we need a decent break, which will hopefully um, happen around Christmas time. But um, so our government took a very cautious approach. Melbourne and the state of Victoria has just had twenty clear days with no no cases, but we're still all working from home. Um, unfortunately, there's been another outbreak in South Australia from a returning traveller. So. You hear that and you just think, oh, here we go again. It's it's mm -hmm. it's not going to end. There's going to be another, there's going to be another flare up. And um, you know, when will things get back to normal? Um, particularly the city. The city is suffering significantly. A lot of businesses are obviously having to, to close because they were forced to close for an extended period of time. So I think it really is starting to get um, on top of people now, um, which isn't surprising because this has been going on since, since March. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some real concerns, I think. Having said that, you know, we're meeting teams for the first time since March. I got a lunch, I had a lunch last Friday in the city, um, meeting my team for lunch on Monday. And then we're having a um, more of a, a team catch up in a few weeks. Um, but certainly we won't be able to meet or gather as a firm. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tough and I think, um, I can't speak for Paul Gleeson who has managing partner, but I, I, I think it's a real concern, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. particularly mental health. Absolutely. Mark, you joined us late and we have made everybody a panelist tonight. So oh, it's welcome. One of those. <laughs> welcome. And, and, Thank uh, you. so just a quick intro and um, we're talking about COVID and, you know, the impact it's had on your firm, but especially you as a managing partner or lead partner in the firm and um, some of the challenges that you continue to face. And while that's all happening in motion, we still have all the challenges of the industry being in flux and changing and competition being what it is. And so how are you dealing with both those things at the same time? I, I wasn't aware that there were any challenges posed by the pandemic. <laughs> so, um, you know, here in New York, which was not the first place that there was a case, it just seemed that way in the March when um, we started to get our uh, U.S. wave of activity. 
Um, we first dealt with things by preparing for what we were afraid was going to happen and did. Um, we used to have Citrix capability for 40 people and we quickly ramped it up and had it up to 100 people before we had to declare the office closed and tell everyone they were working remotely. Uh, so we, we got in front of that one just in the nick of time. Uh, we currently prohibit people, we prohibit attorneys from coming to the office without permission. If you want permission, you fill out an electronic form. You say whether you need to be there for two hours, four hours, or a whole day, and why, and what support, support services you might need. And you promise that you're not sick and you haven't been exposed to anybody. But if your reason for coming in is you left a file on your desk, we don't let you come in and we have it shipped to you instead. You really have to have a better reason than that. We have, however, evolved to the point where mental health, as in I can't stare at my apartment walls or my house walls anymore and I have to come in for a day, is a reason that we're allowing limited access. So, you know, we have moved more quickly toward technological answers, not because technology is the answer, but because technology allows us to work in ways that we hadn't before. Um, as I mentioned um, in a discussion yesterday, um, before this happened, we were occasional users of Skype uh, if there was an international conversation taking place. And I had started to introduce Zoom into our operations. I'd used it with some of my not-for-profit activities. Um, needless to say, we ramped up quickly uh, but the important thing is making sure that we're not just using tech for the sake of tech, we're using tech to meet our clients where they are. Mm -hmm. um, if a client wants to use Google Hangouts, we'll be on Google Hangouts. Uh, if a client prefers Teams because they're concerned about Zoom security, um, we're on Teams and we're in the process of a Microsoft upgrade and you know getting ready to roll Teams out to everybody now. Um, we don't know what the workplace is going to look like in the future in New York. We do know that uh, people certainly are finding that there are challenges in working remotely and we miss the personal aspect of collaboration. Um, for some people, it's uh, more challenging to work this way from an efficiency standpoint, but other people are finding that they work more efficiently, mm -hmm. uh, that they are able to manage their lives in ways they might not otherwise be able to. We have members of our staff who have young children whose school lives have been disrupted. And um, earlier today, the New York City schools announced they're closing again starting tomorrow. Yeah. Um, they'll open hopefully soon, but nobody said exactly when. Uh, we know it'll be for at least two weeks. Um, one sec, honey, can you take Rachel? Sorry, that would be that would be the college student calling in. I can pick <laughs> her up and bring her home tomorrow. So So let me ask you all a question. And, and you know, it seems regardless of jurisdiction, you know, many of the challenges are you face are the same, you know, being, you know, a leader in the firm and wanting to the best for all the people, right? All your uh, partners associates, business staff, support staff, um, and, and just, you know, relying on you to provide constant direction, right? Which is, has to be somewhat stressful because you've got to figure it all out. There's no game plan for this, right? You're making it up as you go along. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, the client side of things, because that's also challenging. Uh, retaining and growing clients, everybody's targeting everybody else's clients, everybody's got you know, contacts with your clients as you do with, with others' clients. And so what are some of the key initiatives you have in place for managing these client relationships where very often, I mean, not all clients are local, clearly for anybody, um, but very often, you know, part of how people do business is meeting people in person or having lunches or going for walks with clients or things like that, particularly in the bigger cities, right? And so what, what are you all doing? And just kind of round robin here in terms of discussion, what are you all doing? Uh, what's at the forefront for uh, strategic initiatives for client retention and growth? 
we're meeting our clients where they are, which means sometimes in one-on-one -on -one or one -on two-on-two -on -two video chats. Um, sometimes we send them their favorite beverage ahead of time so mm -hmm. we can have a, a planned happy hour event. Um, for a larger group of people, we've actually uh, curated a, a wine tasting for uh, a mixture of prospective clients, clients, and client referral sources um, with a sommelier to uh, join in the picture. Um, our clients are do going through the same things we are. Mm -hmm. um, they're living the same reality and everybody is appreciative of the fact that we're putting health first. It's a, it's a rare client who is insisting on meeting in person. Sure, yeah. And in some cases, I would imagine um, all of you that that uh, it's brought you closer in different ways, right? The partners closer in different ways with clients because we're meeting clients and they're in their living room or in their home or you know have a child photo bombing the Zoom screen or whatever it is, and everybody just seems a little bit more relaxed on some level. Um, what, what we did is, I mean, here, yeah, I mean, it's we. Can we're out, you know, we've never been a lockdown here. We've got, you know, two, three few cases. Our people are still very, very worried. Communication, calling them. I, I, I call them every other day. How's your family? How are you getting on? What are you up to? Um, look, when things get a bit better, we'll go out for uh, lunch. And, you know, we can't, we're not sponsoring this cricket match. We're not taking, we're not doing this. We're not having the Christmas parties. Um, we're doing all of that. But the, what we are very concerned about is our staff. For example, we always have, you know, Christmas, you know, lunch, dinners, we're having it all in our office. So we'll do that. And the kids will invite families along because we can, we're allowed to do that anyway. You know, there's no restrictions on that. Whereas if you're limited to four people in groups outside and you're limited to four per table in restaurants here. So we're very strict you know, on the mask. It's a, it, you have to wear your mask everywhere. Nobody goes, sets foot out in the street without your mask on, even outside my office. The minute I leave my office, my mask goes on. And so it's a very sort of a very Hong Kong you know, local thing as well. So it's communication, it's caring about the office, it's talking. But again, we're so lucky compared to what I hear is going on in the rest of the world. You know, mm -hmm. um, everyone's in office, we're in court, we're, we're not having that. But we're all very worried about, you know, how this is, you know, again, the end game and all of this. Sure, sure. Allowed China to behave pretty badly yeah. here as to what's happened because yeah. the distractions and all the rest which we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And and Ramesh and Yushen, um, you know, comparatively speaking, total lockdown, right? I mean, nobody can leave their home even. Um, and so, or I think in some cases, one person was able to go shopping, uh, but, uh, and so how are you, how are you dealing in your jurisdictions with um, just encouraging people to stay connected to clients and keeping that client partner firm relationship going? Yeah, um, I think, um, I mean, we've had similar challenges, um, um, you know, like some of the other um, you know, the other speakers before me. Uh, I think uh, one of the things we spoke about is, uh, can we keep the communication ongoing? Um, you know, even a two-line personalized email uh, can send the right message. So can we continue to do that? And is there a way we can match our service to the, you know, the shifting agenda of the client? You know, can we introduce new partners um, or, you know, bring in a particular expertise uh, in an area that may uh, make sense to the client. Uh, you know, it's a lot of focus on crisis advisory, uh, you know, and things like that. I, I, ideas that can deepen the trust uh, between us and the client. So mm -hmm. try to focus on, uh, on those uh, things. And I think the other thing that we've noticed is that um, clients are flooded with information. You know, um, how can we be more innovative? You know, what are the innovative channels beyond the standard articles or emails, uh, you know, that, um, you know, uh, that we can use to get our perspective mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of clients, you know. Uh, and if it's taking longer than a week from idea to publication um, or a client discussion, uh, I think that's too long in this uh, fluid, uh, you know, time. So, uh, uh, so I think that's, that's on the client side, you know, staying connected, uh, you know, having this occasional chat, as Colin mentioned, how are you doing? How's family doing? Um, and, and, and things like that, you know, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, pretty much what, 
the other people are trying to do here. Right, so yeah, pretty much the same here as well uh, in Malaysia. I, I Personally, I found that during, especially during the full lockdown, as I mentioned, the, the MCO where all economic sectors were, were shut down, um, you would find that, I guess, spending more time at home, when you have a little bit more time at home, you're actually doing your work, and in between you have a little bit more free time, you think of, I suppose, more innovative ways to keep in touch or keep in communication, to communicate with your clients. And I found that during that period, you could actually spend a bit more time chatting with a client on a social level, on a social basis, mm -hmm. whether it's through a WhatsApp text message or... Uh, I suppose, a WhatsApp video call. And that, I guess, you know, we we found that, you know, to be quite useful, keeping touch with our clients, like like what Colin said, and I echo what Ramesh said as well, just dropping that line to see how you're doing, how's your family doing, to constantly remind your clients that you're still uh, thinking about them and, you know, you're there if they need any sort of legal service. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, Rod, one question, you know, I'll start with you is there has been um, as and, and actually a client just wrote me about this tonight because we're doing a fees, you know, increased fees presentation to their partners tomorrow. How do you ask for fee increases? And I said, well, that's interesting because I think you're going to get a lot of pushback right now from clients on that topic. But, um, uh, you know let's not let a good pandemic go to waste. So clients are really using this to push back on firms right now uh, about rates, which was happening before the pandemic, right? But now it's even more pronounced. So how are you, how are you all handling that? And Rod, you know, you, I love the way you guys price. Anyway, your pricing strategies are really interesting. So I'll start with you on that one. Uh, that's a that's an issue that plays out very differently across our practice groups because we you know we have elements of our practice that um, work very much uh, in, our, in the alternative fee space. There are other parts of the practice like mine where I do labor employment law and, and a lot of that's in the public sector and it's very hard to get exotic with fee arrangements in the public <laughs> sector. Right. So. Um, you know, I, I think uh, in the in the fee-based work that we do, um, you know, we just actually had a huddle about this a week ago. We we're, um, we are uh, planning to adjust our fees upwards at the, the start of the year as we normally do. It's going to be a modest increase. Um, we have um, kind of a long track record of of matching what we're doing to the economy. I think people have come to expect that. I, I think. We um, kind of with, with my pushing a little bit um, are going to are going to move forward on some price increases because I think you know what we've found is we're oversubscribed anyway and um, if you don't if you don't do the price increase you don't just lose that money next year but for every year after that right. I think we've been we've been overly conservative about that in the past so um, there's a lot of messaging going out with that to our customers about you know, how we're doing that and why and kind of how it it it, their their uh, our fee strategy has has worked to their advantage over time, and so far we haven't had any pushback on on that. Um, you know, there'll be other parts of our practice where those fees are a little bit more negotiated with some big institutional clients, and and I'll have more to say about that when those discussions have happened. <laughs> but uh, but for now, that's our approach. Mm -hmm. How about anyone else on just? Uh... How you're dealing with with clients today and some of the fees discussions or pushback? What are the changes that you're seeing from the client side? I think um, I think it's getting harder. I think when the pandemic started, there was a real push to make sure you were in touch with clients on a regular basis. Um, but I've noticed that it's it's just getting harder. I think people are genuinely getting sick of Zoom and everything else, I'm, I'm finding it harder to connect to clients as it drags on. Uh, it's not obviously not a problem when there's a piece of work you're doing for them that are actively engaged. Um, but I, yeah, I, I just find it's getting harder as, as things drag on. Regarding, yeah. This is David Gross from, from Birch Hardner here in Anchorage. I think 
you know, fortunately, we found that a lot of clients have really turned to us in this time of crisis. And it's been able to us not only to help them out and they feel appreciative of that, but to create some different relationships. Uh, but one thing we are going to do during the holiday season is really try to step up the uh, sort of the personal touch with some of the gifts that we'll send out to the important clients just to kind of reconnect in that regard. Everyone likes getting presents. And so we're going to try to increase um, what we typically do during the holiday season to see if we can just to re-spark some of those connections. Yeah, I will be sending out a great present for everybody, Christmas masks. <laughs> the firm's logo on it. Um, that, that's our initiative for this year. We're going to be sending it, we're sort of sending everyone out to say, wear your mask. And, and I'll be honest, I, I was just thinking, I think I don't wear a mask, people don't like wearing it. But I honestly say, if you wear your mask properly and you go outside, really, it does help. I mean, we see the results here with, you know, very, 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 very few cases. So I'm going to be sending masks out to everybody, little packets. You know. <laughs> Are they so, going to be made in Wuhan, Colin, or? No, they're going to be. I think. I think we're going to be. I think they're made in. Actually, we can't say made in Hong Kong, but we're going to put them in because we're not allowed to say. It'll be made in China, <laughs> unfortunately. But no, we don't. I don't think we have any made in. We're just going to send them out as presents. <laughs> but back to the interesting thing about fees and about structure. You know, we've remained normal. You know. We haven't, you know, we look at each particular case, if it's a big matter or a difficult matter, when we try and, you know, we charge what is fair, and we're not changing it, anything at all. I mean, the interesting thing was yesterday, I had all my associates in a room, and the big question was, we didn't lay anybody off, no one was furloughed, but everyone was saying, what about pay reviews? And we said, right, we'll reconsider next March. We didn't do anything this year, and we will reconsider, because it's been tough, but we promised everyone that we give a sort of, you know, um, yearly, you know, discretionary bonus double pay. It's a tradition out in Hong Kong in the Far East that you give everyone the um, double pay. <coughs> Promised everyone we're going to maintain that as part of relationships at the start. But clients, I found, have been quite happy to pay more money, you know. I mean, in the past, you know, as long as you're reasonable and, and, and it's value for money and they're connecting with you. But, you know, of course, we haven't been stupid and they're sort of setting out that we're increasing our fees because of this and that. Because we've managed to sort of beat our landlords down a bit and you know and uh, we've been able to make savings and expenses as well yeah i think i think i think it's easy uh, uh, in my experience it's easy in these times to let uh, the pricing discipline slip uh, you know we we need to be creative in providing uh, pricing or volume relief uh, you know rather than reflexively locking into long term uh, highly discounted arrangements. Um, I think we should way, explore ways to offer more strategic investments, mm -hmm. uh, you know, flexible payment terms, uh, you know, credit towards future services, uh, you know, alternative fee arrangements. Um, so I think, uh, and, and speaking for our firm, uh, we haven't really had any client come and ask for discounts. So, um, so I, think, uh, I, think, I think one needs to be a little cautious about mm. Uh, you know, being too grateful for the business you're getting at this point. I found that in general, clients are more conscientious about wanting to understand the cost up front. Um, even when things are not uh, on a flat fee or at some other form of alternate fee arrangement, and we're dealing with the billable hour, mm -hmm. um, it's very important to them to have budgets and timetables and expectations. Um, we found that our clients, after the initial hiccup, really needed us more. They had more things for us to do. Um, our commercial landlords and commercial tenants both needed us to represent them in um, lease renegotiations. Our uh, commercial mortgage operators needed us to review uh, mortgage deferral arrangements. And they knew that it was going to cost them some money, but it was also about saving them some money. The attention to those questions up front, combined with close attention to a client's needs, to understand that the client who is financially distressed can use a little bit of a courtesy break, and as Ramesh suggested, maybe some additional time in which to pay or other considerations, goes a long way because you're showing that you're paying attention to their circumstances. Um, I don't envision difficulties in um, considering raises for our attorneys next year, nor for um, modest and appropriate increases in rates. 
Um, I think the important part is for our clients to understand that we're not raising our rates so we can make more profit, but we're raising our rates because we're investing in the talent that brings them the results that they care about. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So in the little time we have left, and it's been great to hear all of your perspectives on these things, I would uh, love to hear one more, one more answer from all of you. What about all of this in particular has made you a better managing partner or better partner in your firm? When I go first, um, slowing down and thinking more. It's a regular uh, reminder to act with intentionality, which may be another way of saying what Colin said. Mm -hmm. I, I feel um, uh, this is uh, really uh, it made me understand um, the kind of issues uh, more the younger associates are going through, uh, particularly in a city like Mumbai, you know, um, where you're commuting for three, three hours. And I, and I can I actually see them being more efficient when they don't have to do this uh, commute. And uh, so, and for me, I see this as a game changer in many ways. Um, I, I feel we can perhaps, um, this can be a great incentive to retain talent if we are able to offer some, not just um, you know, some flexibility with, you know, hours, but also maybe we will have one day in a week, people can opt to work from home and things like that, because I can see that productivity uh, getting augmented significant, significantly, uh, you know, because of the way the city is organized, you know, so, so for me, that's been the great, uh, the great learning in this, uh, you know, this whole thing. I, think I, for me, I, I have a, I'm sorry, go ahead, David. Oh, thanks. I was just going to say, I find myself thinking more about people's personal circumstances and how that might affect their ability to be responsive and turn things around, um, particularly given homeschooling and those sorts of issues that people faced. I have a practice that in normal times keeps me out of the office quite a lot. And, and the fact that, that all of that's happening virtually now has enabled me to spend quite a bit more time and quite a bit more structured time with our non-attorney, you know, business manager. And, and I've found that's, that's been valuable. I mean, we, we've, we've, I think been a lot more effective in, in planning and thinking strategically just because she's got more of my attention than, than I've given her in the past. And, and I think that will continue when we get back to some more normal environment. I'd say the other thing that's a dynamic in the U S is you know, we we've had this, um, this this social moment going since the the killing of George Floyd early in the year and and mm -hmm. um, you know that's something that that I as an individual and our firm kind of as a group have invested a lot of energy in and I think the the reading and and um, and, and the, the interactions that we've had around diversity and inclusion issues has been really valuable to me I think that's that's been um, eye-opening and it's something that, that it remains a real priority for us moving forward. I would just echo what sort of Andrew said in that I think it's given me the opportunity to, to be more compassionate with the folks in the office and, mm -hmm. and realize that they may be going through issues and, and I think I've connected with many people on a more personal level than I probably would have had this COVID uh, pandemic not come by. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, from my experience, um, I agree with uh, Andrew and David. Uh, similarly, it has in a way, uh, you know, given me more perspective uh, in terms of uh, my staff, their personal circumstances. And I think in a way it has helped me understand, uh, you know, uh, the challenges that they face on, on a more real level. And it has also, I guess, in a way, I, I hope, has brought us closer as a team mm -hmm. uh, because we share uh, common problems, common challenges as, as humans, right? As a managing partner, I feel that it has uh, allowed me or basically forced me to, to think out of the box, to be a bit more creative and innovative in terms of how we're going to navigate 
play our practice uh, during these uh, unprecedented times. And I think for the first time, really, I mean, we had to come up with a business continuity plan. Uh, we did come up with one earlier, um, but I think, you know, it has forced us to do certain things, which obviously has a, has a positive spin to it, right? That's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, it's, it's something we heard this morning too, right, Wendy? It just, you know, has connected yes. everybody with the, the human side of the firm a little bit more. And that's probably a nice change, right? For, for all of you, it just, every, it, re, it makes you realize, I think the commitment people have to the firm and gives you probably in some ways a sense of a better sense, not that you don't have a sense of purpose, but it gives a little bit more meaning to your role, knowing that uh, you're helping people and they're relying on you and they're looking for guidance. So that that's a nice position and also a challenging position to be in for sure. So any last parting comments? It's been so nice to spend part of my uh, Boston evening with all of you <laughs> and some of your mornings, uh, depending on where you are. Um, great to see you all. And uh, any, yeah, if any, any other parting comments before we leave? Keep safe. Keep safe. Wear your Keep mask. Keep safe. Yep. Colin Perfect. says, wear your mask. We all expect one of those masks, Colin. We do. Colin, yes. I'm up. Thank you for, for taking time to connect with each other. Um, we, we actually had a European member today say that that she felt more encouraged after these ally Zoom sessions to realize that it wasn't just her city or even her country, but that it was it was something that um, was being faced in very similar ways all over the world. Uh, so I, I know that you have a lot on your plate and I very much appreciate your time on this session today. Very good. We will have a, a video up in the next few days. Good thank afternoon, you all. or good good and night, or good morning. Thank you all, everybody. All right, look, keep, look after yourselves. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.